you might be wondering at this point, why all this focus on Base64? Weren't we supposed to be writing a JSON RPC server? And now we've got the library installed, so why don't we just get going on that? Well, hold on a minute. Apart from being an illustrative example of how a bug in an implementation of an encoding that gets used all over the internet could have been avoided, Base64 is also really small. It's toy problem sized, but it's also practical, and it also happens to be a good use case for demonstrating some of Hammer's more powerful features in not very many lines of code. So let's take a few minutes to understand how Base64 works and how we can think of it as a language, and then we'll translate those intuitions about our Base64 language directly into working C. RFC 4648 explains in section 4 that the Base64 encoding process transforms 24 bit groups of input bits, so three binary octets into four characters of output, which is 32 bits. It does this by splitting each 24 bits of input into four groups of six bits, then using the numeric value of each six-bit group as the index into a lookup table of values in the Base64 output alphabet. And when I use the word alphabet, I really mean the list of characters that are valid in that language, like the Roman alphabet for English or the Cyrillic alphabet for Russian. There's also a special padding character, which you can think of as sort of like punctuation. If the length of the input in bytes is evenly divisible by 3, then the length of the output in bytes will be evenly divisible by 4. But if there are 8 or 16 bits left over, and you can't make any more full 24-bit blocks out of your input, that's where the padding character comes in. If you have 8 bits or 1 octet left over in your input, then the 4-character output block will be 2 base64 characters followed by 2 equal signs. If you have 16 bits or 2 octets left over in your input, then the output block will be three base64 characters followed by one equals sign. So the equals character only ever appears for padding at the end, like a period at the end of a sentence, when the whole message is just one sentence. This means that to decode base64, we'll need to transform four character blocks in the base64 alphabet back into the original 24-bit sequence that produced them. So every four characters of base64 turns into three octets of binary, and if any character shows up that's not in the base64 alphabet, the whole encoded string is wrong. There are also only a few patterns that these four character blocks can fall into. They can be four base64 characters, three characters followed by an equals, or two characters followed by two equals. If the length of the input in characters doesn't divide evenly by four, it's not a valid base64 string. And there are some simple constraints on the way the four character blocks can be laid out in a sequence. Only the block at the end can have any equal signs in it, whether it has one or two. There's also an even subtler pattern that describes the layout of the four character blocks. In a block with one character of padding, there are only 16 possible characters in the base64 alphabet that the last character of content can be. And in a block with two characters of padding, there are only four possible choices for the last content character. Let's see why that is. If eight bits of base64 alphabet corresponds to six bits of octet content, then one full octet encoded in base64 needs two characters to represent it. The first character decodes to the first six bits of the octet, and we decode the second character into another six bits that we only need two of. We pull those from the most significant bit direction, so if they're both zero, then the encoded value is in uppercase A. If they're zero, one, the encoded value is in uppercase Q. If they're one, zero, the encoded value is a lowercase g. If they're one, one, the encoded value is a lowercase w. And then the last two characters in the base64 block are padding. Because those are the only values that a base64 encoder can put in front of those two padding characters, that means that any base64 decoder we write should only accept those four characters in that location. So we'll write a recognition rule for this situation, since we want to be definite about what we're willing to accept. Similarly, two full octets encoded in base64, that's 16 bits, needs three characters to represent it. The first character, again, gives us the first six bits of the first octet. The second character decodes into another six bits, giving us 12. And we get the last four from the third character. We can see, again, that there's only a limited subset of the base64 alphabet that's valid in the last content position before the single padding character. Here, instead of being every 16th character, starting from 0 and going to 16, 24, and 48, every fourth character in the alphabet is valid in this position. And we'll include a recognition rule for that as well. It's only one line of code, it's really easy to remember, and most importantly, it makes your assumptions about what's happening in the code more clear to anyone who's reading it. If they say, well, why does this code only allow this subset of the alphabet here? They can reason through it and see that yes, in fact, for an encoded string to validly decode to something, that property would have to hold, and your code properly determines this. 
Now, with this formal description of what constitutes validly base64 encoded data, we can put all these rules together, and suddenly we have a grammar for the structure of base64. Next, we're going to implement this grammar in code. When we're done with that step, we'll have a complete recognizer for base64 encoded data. It won't do anything other than recognize strings in base64. That is to say, if the string input to it is valid base64, it'll return true, and if it's not, it'll return false. Once we have that in place, we'll be able to hook up some semantic actions to handle the transliteration of four character base64 blocks into triplets of octets. Semantic actions are what unleash the power of Hammer. You can think of them as events that fire when the parsers they're attached to parse something successfully, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. In the next video, we'll write some unit tests for a base64 recognizer, and then we'll actually implement it. See you next time.